welcome to the official Lakes International Comic Art Festival podcast. My name's Ian. And my name's Nikki, bringing you the best in comics and graphic novels and updates from the festival. Please welcome, I've stolen this off your website, uh, multi-award winning cartoonist, um, illustrator, writer, graphic novelist, broadcaster, ranter and poet, Martin Wilson. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. Um, first of all, yeah, we, we've said on the podcast previously, you mm-hmm. made this year's Lakes yes. for us. Your your humour and, 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 and your art as well, your styles, mm-hmm. just, it just, it was something different. Absolutely. Yeah. It was absolutely brilliant. So thank you, first of all, for that. Oh, well, thank you, thank you. I mean, you, I, I listened to your podcast, and I was I was very, very um, touched and flattered. It was, it was very, you said some very nice things about me um, because um, actually, I had such an indecently good time in Kendall. <laughs> I didn't deserve any kind of flattery. I just I should have been paying them. But <laughs> Don't tell them that too loud. They'll, they'll take you up on that. Um, so, did you read comics and stuff as a kid? Were you into 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 comics and art back back in the day? Um, well, I've always been. Um, it's one of those, you know, one, one of those kids who sits in the corner scribbling away, drawing. I've, mm-hmm. I mean, for as long as I can remember, I've been drawing. And um, because I was adopted, I don't even know where this comes from. I mean, I don't know what, what gene is operating there. Um, but uh, at the age, I mean, the um, I keep on telling people the story, but it's but it's actually quite significant and important. It's a kind of um, road to Damascus story. Um, where at the age of 10, I picked up my sister's history school textbook, which was filled with cartoons from Hogarth and Gilray and Cruikshank and Rowlandson onwards, um, up to David Lowe. It's the his- illustrated history of Britain, 1780 to 1945. And I just thought these were the most wonderful things I'd ever seen in my life. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I was also, like most kids, you know, I read comics, um, you know, the dandy Wizard and Chips, remember mm-hmm. that one? Yes. Um, you know, things like that. Uh, but uh, I owe a, a great debt to my brother-in-law, who in 1976 introduced me to 2000 AD, okay. saying, you, know, "You really have to read this. This should not be allowed into the hands of children." <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it was actually quite hard to get hold of back in the day. Um, and I, I, I spent most of my late teens. Desperately, certainly when I was at university, desperately trying to find somewhere which would stock it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, because it was, it was just, um, I think, a, a revelatory uh, example of, of the greatness of, of British comics. Actually, um, I'm not a huge fan mm-hmm. of um, costume heroes. I'm not a huge fan of Marvel or mm-hmm. Marvel. Marvel was Marvel. the hell it wasn't even Marvel. <laughs> or or DC. I, I just think they're a bit stupid, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's um, they're just a, an extension of the American Imperium in many ways. Um, but what 2000 AD was about, it was it was about being funny mm-hmm. in a true graceful way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you can imagine them in IPC in King's Reach Tower producing this breathtakingly violent, inappropriate stuff, and um, and hiding it when one of the suits came round to see what's going on. <laughs> Uh, but they got away with it. They got away with it. Yes. They got away, got away with it. And you know, my <clears throat> one of my proudest moments um, was getting a letter published in 2000 AD when I was a student. I got a five pound postal order <laughs> <laughs> and a put down Tharg the Mighty. So do not presume to tell me how to run my comic. Earth oh, d- <laughs> <laughs> you definitely started off young then, <laughs> given the opinions. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, and I, I and uh, a sort of regret was I never followed through on this plan I had, which was to write. A, <clears throat> I've told various people this, including Pat Mills. Um, I had this idea for a Judge Dredd story, mm-hmm. which I thought I still think you know, I might do it one day, <laughs> um, where he's being psychoanalyzed, and you don't see him; you just see the back of his head. But he has, he's got his helmet off, <gasps> and he's being psychoanalyzed, and they're sort of going into the depths of why he behaves in the way. He Okay. And his relation with his clone mother and his and Rico and all the rest of it, all the backstory of Dredd, all the sort of hideous Freudian mess inside mm. his his head. And then you're just getting to the point where it's sort of to prove the fact that he is a, a genuine psychopath. When the frame just the drawing in the frame just stops 
It's only half, it's only half drawn. And then you go to the next frame, it's the judges kicking open the doors of this underground comic studio where they're producing anti-judge propaganda. <laughs> that's really good. I tell you, that's cool. <laughs> I think that would One work. Yeah. Talk. Get it, get it done. Get it down. Yeah. Get it, get it down. Get it down. Um. So, so you were drawing as a as a youngster, but then uh, am I right in thinking you went to university to do English? I went to Cambridge University to do English mm-hmm. because that's what they tried to encourage you to do. They said, "Oh, you must go to Cambridge." To do English. <laughs> and I really, really hated it. I had a terrible time. Um, I got a very, very bad degree because I disliked it so much. <laughs> I disliked. Um, I just liked Cambridge because of its complacency. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a nice public school boy following yeah. the trajectory of my destiny, which was to presumably become a lawyer or something like that. And um, and there's just all these people sitting around feeling immensely pleased with themselves, despite the fact that in my the end of my first year, I think about 25 people killed themselves because of the unspeakable pressure of being at Cambridge. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, what's the point of that? You know, what? Nothing is worth this. Nothing is worth this. No. Um, but what I did do was to draw in a lot of um, two-bit student papers, which actually was one of the best um, best trainings I had because after the way of um, you know homemade magazines, um, it was uh, you know put together with cow gum. Mm. Kids, cow gum is gum made out of cow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and what they do is they sort of they type out the copy, and it was it was just kind of listings magazine, mm-hmm. and then they would find gap as they pasted it down, back to the paste up, mm-hmm. and and I would then be expected to fill that with a cartoon. Okay, right. and so I'd be doing like sort of six or seven little tiny drawings in each issue, and just having a whale of a time and doing sort of really delightfully sick and crazy stuff. Um, I want when I was particularly fond of was um the christmas issue where i just had herod the great slicing the heads off some children saying herod the great does his christmas shopping early this <laughs> <laughs> so it was you know sick and crazy fun of the kind that young people should involve themselves with. Of, course. Mm. of course of course so were you um sort of dragged into the political comics then as well or what, what pulled you into the to those styles well um Again, it was it was this you know reading my sister's history textbook. Mm-hmm. Um, I was always interested in politics. Um, always, inter- I mean, uh, my political outlook I think is mostly thanks to my late adoptive father, mm-hmm. who was a who was a scientist, he was a virologist, and he was also a kind of anarchist. Um, he, um, he told me two very useful bits of information, or advice when I was very young. It took me decades to work out what they meant. The first one was whatever you do, never get a job. By which he meant you should, if you possibly can, get away with doing what you mm-hmm. enjoy doing and get paid for it. Um, because his father wanted him to become a lawyer and he became a scientist. And, do and I, I've made sure with our children that they should, if possible, do what they want to do yeah. and they'll yeah. do what they want to do. Um, and the other one was never obey orders, including this one. Yes. <laughs> which I think is advice because it. Because it's almost impossible to work out what it means. Yes. <laughs> That's going to ruin me now for the next two weeks. Is that going to just play at the back <laughs> yeah, of your mind? <laughs> and he had, um, and, and he just, he just sort of had a, a, a utterly heartwarming contempt for authority, including his own. Um, you know, more, more authority over me, a contempt for that. And he would just, you know, he worked in um, the Department of London University in a hospital, and he'd come home and he'd just tell these fantastically baroque stories about the idiocy of the professors running the department. <laughs> and and um, I don't know where he got that from, but it completely informed the way I look at the world. I always work on the basis that anybody who's in a position of authority over me is, by definition, an idiot. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> they yes. mainly are. <laughs> they, they usually are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't bother trying to get from position of authority. Yes. That is, yes. <laughs> That is it. They have to prove something over yeah. the rest of us, yeah. But, yeah, like the old gag, you know, anybody who seeks a nomination to be elected as president of the United States of America should be instantly banned on the ground of mental illness. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to some of them, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that that whole point, though, of, of not working a day in your life, that is a dream, isn't mm. it? I mean, I think you don't realise it unless you, you're told when you're young that that that's what you should be aiming for. Yeah. And then when you get to a point of you realise it, it's a bit too late usually. So yeah, you, you've 
something I wish I'd been told as a mm. as a kid, that's for sure. But you don't, you get pushed in one direction. So yeah, I mean, um, I know. I mean, there's two people I know. One of whom was um, a relative. The other one was, was a very good friend. Both of whom are now dead. Um, and they both um, had pretty miserable and unfulfilled lives because they actually did what their parents said and got jobs which they hated mm. uh, and couldn't find a way out. And I said, you know, I said to both of them, I said, don't do that. Just mm. don't do it. Do anything. Go and, go and run a pet shop. You know, become a juggler. Anything. I mean, starve for a bit. Um, actually, one of my one of my proudest achievements, you know, um, Nick Hayes, the guy who did the Modern Mariner and various other things. Um, he's a uh, does some sort of really interesting graphic novels. Okay. And he approached me when he was very young, and 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 I spent many many years trying to persuade him not to have a job <laughs> and to actually carry on with um, doing his drawing, which he did, which he did. And now he's you know pushing forty; he's living on a boat somewhere. <laughs> uh, one of the country's leading land rights activists, whose latest book is the Book of Trespass, Brilliant. where he spends most of it. I'm just trespassing on landed estates. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, that's uh, definitely not work. <laughs> this, this, this is a definite achievement. Sounds like I fun. have ruined that man's life. He could have been perfectly happy as the area manager. Of the <laughs> and um, you know, occasionally get out some books and you think, well, you know, I could have, I could have done some drawings. I could have done those lovely graphic novels, but but it's probably better being the area manager for for Rico or whatever, um, because at least you know I've, I've got a solid, dependable life. Uh, and yet he'd wake up in the middle of the night screaming. <laughs> You're going to make me cry. That's how I'm feeling right now. <laughs> I know. It's your job. <laughs> um, so with your particular political characters, um, how do you go about initially designing them? Because they always seem to, once you design them, they seem to, to follow mm. through throughout the years. Is there, Did you spend time getting a design right, or do they usually just pop out? Um, it's interesting because, I mean, the thing about, caricature is, is something which I don't understand. I can do it, but I don't know how. Mm. Um, but it is almost um, it's almost alchemical in a way. And you know when it's right and you know when it's wrong. And there have been many people who I've drawn over the years. And when, when, when somebody new comes along, you've got to sort of break in to what they look yeah. like. You've got to feel comfortable. So I always give my advice as you should ultimately feel as though the pen is an extension of your hand, which is an extension of your brain. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's actually part of you. It's almost fused with you. And then it actually does, like, all, all the lines flow out from that. Um, and, you know, w- one of the great things about this job is, is it's not like doing Fred Bassett. It's not doing the same bloody thing mm-hmm. every day, for years after years after years. Because the news changes all the time. People mm-hmm. say, you know, where do you get your ideas from? Like, yeah. the news. Yeah. Very simple. Like, responding to the news. <laughs> Get new characters coming along, or fresh blood, as I like to think of it. <laughs> and you know, somebody comes along, and you then sort of spend some time making sure you've actually got them right. And I'm, um, and it's weird because um, Ed Miliband, for example, it took me two years to be happy that I was drawing Ed Miliband properly. Okay, because there was too much going on. Mm. I mean, Jen was too much um, about him. You'd think he'd be very easy, but no, no, you don't know where to start. You don't know where finish okay. and the fact that his pose was a different shape in profile to the way it was full face yeah made it even worse <laughs> <laughs> and then i finally got him but but also um when Theresa may became prime minister and i had a sort of dark weekend of the soul because one of the things i do is to illustrate kevin mcguire's column in the daily mirror and he was obviously writing about the new prime minister and i'd drawn her a few times because she'd been home secretary but i'd never really sort of gone to town on yeah and i was drawing and i said Fuck, it doesn't look like it it doesn't look like there's something not right. I haven't got my hand up her soul and captured her. Because this is a kind of voodoo. It is a kind of um, you know sympathetic magic. You actually take control of them by drawing them. And then I just dropped her eye fractionally down her face, and it was her. And there it was absolutely and completely her. And I don't know how. I don't know why. Right. But it was. It's just. It's a weird thing. Do Do you um, Do you find you miss them when they go? So it's for, for example Trump. Generally, he's now never in the news, sadly. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't miss Trump, though. I was rather overburdened with too much orange paint. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ordered in, I ordered in extra orange paint when he was elected and sort of kept on ordering in more orange paint. Um, 
I mean, it's always the case that um, the reason I'm drawing them ultimately is because I want them to go away. <laughs> That's a fair comment. Stop, stop drawing me like that. Well, if you if you leave public life, I won't draw you ever again. <laughs> so that's a bit like that. Um, but some of them, I actually just get so much joy out of drawing. I yeah. really, really love drawing um, George Osborne. Mm-hmm. And it was because there was something about he clearly has no bones in his head. I mean, it's, it's, it's just gristle and fat. And he had this sort of sneering mouth that was moving around the side of his face. And I just I just got so much pleasure out of that. And also the fact that halfway through his period of office as Chancellor of the Exchequer, he had a makeover. I don't know if you remember this, but he changed colour. <laughs> <laughs> because previously he'd been a kind of really pasty face. Uh, and secrets of the trade, I would mix uh, flame red and white in the Windsor and Newton gouache range. Mm-hmm be the colour he was, and it was a bit blotchy, with a um, spectrum red mouth, it's a gash like that. And then he, he had a makeover, and he had this kind of Caesar haircut with a little fringe, and he thinned down a lot, and he suddenly became raw sienna. <laughs> he suddenly, because he was under, under a sun lamp. <laughs> really odd. And the thing is, very few of my colleagues noticed this, mm. which I thought was weird, because um, I, I rather like... I mean, I like painting. I mean, when, when they brought in colour in newspapers, I thought to begin with it was a nightmare because uh, I thought it would take twice as long to do it black and white. But it takes less time because of a thing called impressionism mm. that you can put sorts of things on the page without, um, which make it look incredibly overwrought and carefully stippled. Things. And you just do that in three seconds flat. Then you roll the toilet paper to blot it. And it's been sort of carefully marbled by um, you know, teams and teams of craftspeople. But... Um, but I like but I like painting my victims, subjects, whatever they are, <laughs> the colour they are. Mm. And they're all different colours. So, so Boris Johnson is Naples yellow and mm-hmm. um, Dominic Raab is red. I mean, he's a sort of really deep, unhealthy red colour, presumably because he's got thoughts inside his head, which... Um, <laughs> we, we don't need to hear. Yeah. We, we don't want to go there. No. no. There are no Bible laws in this <laughs> Um, so you've sort of answered that sort of question. So are you doing everything by hand? You don't go digitally at all? I don't know how. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. So I just yeah. genuinely haven't a clue. That's um, you. Yes, I can't, <laughs> I have. I have tried it, but I just I can't see the point. Um, I always the advice I always, I always give people who ask me for it is is get dirty. You know, do what makes you feel comfortable. Use mm. it if you feel happier mm. using it pad or using it being digital that's fine yeah. mm. do it that way but actually what part of the joy of this part of the joy of making marks is it's messy mm-hmm. in, in my book the you know the greatest two cartoonists and indeed illustrators of the 20th century are ronald searle and um ralph steadman and that's because they're mucky mm. they're having fun getting dirty, there are blocks, there are splats, they break the rules, they draw through lines, they do all sorts of stuff. And it's messy. And and I just think that's part of the joy of it. You know, nothing is more fun than building around in shit, as any dog will tell you. <laughs> Good. I, I'm, I, I must admit, I'm a, I like to see art mm. as it is. Yeah. I must admit, rather than the digital. I get why people use digital. Mm. It's so much um, easier to edit. I guess, yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah. no, I, I do prefer the... I don't want to say real art because I'll get into trouble for saying that. <laughs> well, it's not real art, but it's... And but you know it's, what it's, I mean. Tactile. Yeah, but there's some. There's actually something about the tactility. I actually yeah. get a real buff out of the feel of the brush on the on the paper. Mm. That, yeah. You know, which I do every, yeah. almost every day I, doing this. You know, I've just spent a, most of the day doing a cartoon for The Guardian. Um, really quite miraculously because I, I had my booster jab yesterday. Oh, yes. Um, I had a Pfizer for the first time, and I felt absolutely terrible as well. I'm feeling fine now. Yes, I but did I was, with uh, my Pfizer booster. I was wiped out the next day. Totally, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I, you know, I thought it was going to be fine because all the other ones I've had have been mm-hmm. fine. But this mm-hmm. was a Pfizer. But I thought, you know, I'm a professional. I shall work through this. Um, and actually, I'm just sort of nice, quite quiet, calm bit of painting. Mm-hmm. Um, as people always say to me, you know, God, you're so angry because it's all these revolting images. Why are you doing? No, 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 no. 
I'm calming down by doing watercolors. Mm. Is what I'm doing. I could, yeah, yeah. See, yeah. I can't paint anything. She's looking at me. She knows it all. She knows how it feels. <laughs> That's because I yeah do my watercolors. That's all right. <laughs> um. So obviously you had the uh, amazing exhibition up at the lakes. Mm. Um, and we mentioned it on the podcast that we both, whilst walking around separately, were pulled by the the banality of evil. Yeah, that that piece yeah. of work was just yeah stunning in 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 artistic talent and just a message mm. it put across. Um, do you find your your paintings affect people like that quite often? Because obviously some of the subjects are going to be very humorous and they're not going to have that same power. Um, but they well, um, you know, people are people are very nice if they like it. People are very horrible if they don't. There's only death threats, but. <laughs> As I always say, a death threat by Twitter doesn't count. You need one of your children's ears sent to your home address. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, I I do actually try to use all the different equipment in the cartoonist armory, mm-hmm. of which you only one. Um, <clears throat> I also like to give them a full canvas. I like to sort of get lots of detail in there. Yeah. Because people enjoy it. People just enjoy looking at it. I mean, I, I personally revere Gilray um, because there are various Gilray engravings, etchings, um, where you can... Oh, they're, they're, about, they're about sort of A4 of the originals. You know, it's not the original, they're printing. The prints are actually about A4. They're not very big. But you can imagine stepping into them and walking for a week. And I always like the idea that you can magically step into one of my cartoons mm-hmm. and stop walking through it, yeah. find it, turn around a corner. Cool my God, there's another fur cut. You know, <laughs> weird things glimpsed here and there. Yeah. And uh, a sufficiently large number of people also enjoy doing that. So, um, you know, which is nice. But yeah, no, it's it's that particular piece. Mm, so well, it stopped us, didn't it? It did. So, yeah. It did. It's stunning. Stunning. Mm. Uh, so you've done a few graphic novels, and like you say, you do some come strips as well. Do you prefer yeah. the strips or the one-off pieces? Which, which, what, what would you rather be doing? Um, I think I prefer. Uh, I, I, I like doing the political cartoons, the you know, single frame things, yeah. um, because they pay me an awful lot of money, <laughs> <laughs> and I can do it in about four or five hours, and. Um, and I get a buzz out of it. It's a nice way to spend a day. Mm-hmm. Um, to, I don't want to do them too often. I don't, you know, I need to. I do two and a half a week for the Guardian. You know, I don't want to do more than that. Yeah. And um, but I also really enjoy doing graphic novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I have had cartoon strips running in the past. They are a bit laborious because in order to make it look nice, and actually, my entire motivation in, when I'm painting or drawing something is if I think it looks nice. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you get oppressed by a deadline. You've got to rush things, and it doesn't look as good as it should do, and things like that. I mean, this, this is what I just finished doing. Wow. Oh, wow. That looks rather nice. I'm rather pleased with that. Um, but, the, um, but the graphic novels, I mean, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pitch some ideas to self-made hero. I think might have a very fruitful relationship and I think I think they're a great publishing house mm-hmm. because they are small yeah. and they care because it matters mm. and I've worked with publishers who have always said you know having a book published by a big publisher is a bit like parenthood in Sparta because you have the, the joy of conception then the sort of slog of pregnancy <laughs> and then the book is published and the publishers come along and like a baby in Sparta, they take it by the leg and throw it on the roof to see if it survives the night. And you never hear anything more from it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. You know, you never, you know, and the only, um, you know, I've, I've done many books over the years and I've done Jonathan Cape, people like that, mm-hmm. um, gave me nice big advances. Um, the only publishing house where I've ever earned royalties is Self Made Hero. Oh, right. Uh, royalty statement. Of- which is weird, yeah. And you, I, I don't understand. I don't understand what the what the economics is. But a multinational publisher gives you a fifteen thousand pound advance to mm. spend a, doing a book, <clears throat> which is nice. It's good to have mm. money. 
Yeah. And then they don't promote it. They don't, yeah. you know, they remain for it rapidly. Mm-hmm. They don't seem to care. They think the way of publicizing it is to send you to literary festivals where you don't get paid and you sign three copies and things like that. Yeah. Whereas self media it actually matters to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the great irony is um, I did this comic book version of the Communist Manifesto for them, yeah. which has been more money than any other book I've ever done. Really? <laughs> I mean, it's just because because they sold the rights to eleven different territories, yeah. and you know we got a new kitchen out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Comic, didn't want it. Comics get your kitchens. There we go. That's a new tagline. <laughs> Comics get your kitchens. No, we we love self made hero, don't we? Yeah. The, the books they produce are always stunning. Yeah, and they're easy to deal with, like you say. Mm. You know, they're trying to promote yeah. the wares, and they'll, they'll just chat away to you. It's brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, no, I think I think they're wonderful. I love it. Yeah, and I'm just trying to think of the next book I want to do with them because I do want to do another book with them. So mm. just, they they do it properly. Yeah. They are, they are pro- um, is there any cartoon that you regret? Um, you sort of sit back now, five years later, and you think maybe I was a bit harsh on that one. Or... There are some cartoons I've done where people have misinterpreted them and the people I was targeting for offence were not offended because, you know, they sh- off. But <laughs> other people thought that they were being targeted and were offended. And on those occasions, I have apologised. About 10 years ago, I was rather loose in my use of um, language about mental illness. Okay. okay. And somebody objected. And mm. I sort of said, no, you're absolutely right. I will be more careful in the future. Mm. Uh, but for the most part, if people are upset by what I've done, it's normally because I want them to be upset. He's <laughs> hit the right <laughs> message. Yeah. I, it's a great gift of offence. <laughs> and a lot of people are crying out to be offended. It's how, how most political discourse operates, that they just want to be offended mm-hmm. so they can get self-righteous and yes. organise a Twitter pile on the Twitter. Like One of my favourite stories about cartoonist Rick Brooks, who used to do a pocket cartoon in Metro, and when um, oh god, I'm a senior moment. The man who wrote a short history of time, the great I'm gonna astrophysicist, who lived in a wheelchair. Stephen What's Hawking. Stephen? I thought I was going to say that. I thought no, I'll, I'll be stupid if I say that. <laughs> no, no, sorry, just a senior moment. A long day full of Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> um, anyway, he um, he'd been rushed into Addenbrooke's. And this was a news story which had broken, and everybody thought this was the end. You know, it's absolutely terrible that you know he'd had a heart attack or something. And Rick somehow or other managed to get away with doing a cartoon of Hawking slumped in his wheelchair with a doctor on one side and a nurse on the other. One of them saying to the other, "Have we tried switching him off and switching him back on again?" <laughs> and on the social media, you know, no bigger than a man. The cloud no bigger than a man's hand. There was a well, a surge of people who, who were just, this is the most disgracefully obscene, disgusting cartoon ever published. And they were just getting up, they were going to have a good old lynching and they were going to tear Rick to pieces and guarantee he never worked again and cancel him off all platforms forever and this kind of thing. And then Hawking bought the original and ruined their fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. At least that's the, the person who's aimed at. Yeah, but you know, there's a. I don't know if anybody else has, has concluded, uh, thanks to the, the technology provided by um, amoral nerds <laughs> on the internet, uh, that there are a huge number of human beings with whom we share this planet who are quite clearly total arseholes. <laughs> yes. I mean, unremitting pieces yeah. of shit. And... Um, you just think, just look at yourselves for a moment. I would, I would turn it off. I, mean, I know we're, we're talking through this magic. No, phone I'm at the moment. complete agreement. Yeah. Oh yeah. I would, I, would, I would turn off the internet, and we'd be plunged back into the dark ages of 1987. Oh, I like 1987. That's fine. I mean, I, mean, I like a bit of online shopping, but the rest of it, the rest of it, completely well, agree with you. <laughs> completely agree. Well, I got, I got, you got married in 1987. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching He Man in 1987. You're watching so <laughs> We have a tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you feel, and, and obviously the answer would be yes, but um, that, that these the, the comics in newspapers are still 
vital and important because mm. um, obviously numbers are going down with, with newspaper sales as we know but i mean yeah i mean the, the thing is um uh, newspapers have been part of the ecology of political cartoons for a very short period of time i mean the first political cartoon to appear in a daily newspaper was in 1900 okay um they appeared in magazines before then but you know 80 years previous, prior to that, they were all selling as individual prints from little okay. kiosks stretching down the strand. And um, so the, the golden, you know, over 300 years of the tolerance of visual satire um, from the late 17th century onwards, only a third of that has taken place in newspapers, which makes it easier for the cartoonists because we don't have to actually vlog this stuff <laughs> ourselves. Uh, we get paid money by um, by the by the papers instead. But you know, as I always say, like any self respecting parasite, if our host dies, we jump off it, find another one. <laughs> um, because visual satire has been around yeah. for as long as people have. You know, people have been drawing. You know, the oldest known drawing and human drawing, I think, now is forty four thousand years old, and that's sort of mm -hmm. it's thought that language is fifty thousand years yeah. old. So this is what we do. You know, this is what this is how we. We have this stuff inside our heads and we want to communicate it with other people. And so we, we tell stories mm -hmm. and we also draw the stuff we've seen and have filtered it through our heads. And I think that's what makes us unique, that actually that's how we cope with reality, yeah. by retelling, by re it. And it's about control. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact that when I do a nasty cartoon of the Prime Minister, my inbox will be filled with people who love it because it, they feel they're back in control mm. because of laughter. Yeah. And laughter is also about control. Laughter yeah. is used as beings as a social control. And um, and it means that, you know, in, in, a, in a world which is terrifyingly out of the control of individuals, drawing and laughter, one of the ways in which individuals can take back for a brief period of time some notion of control You've just got to laugh at evil, haven't you? You've got to laugh at the bad things. That's that's what it all comes down to, in my head. Yeah, well, really, you, you, don't, you don't need to laugh good things. Yeah. No. Because they're good. They're, good. Mm. they're nice. Look, there's, a, there's a sweet little bunny rabbit hopping across a daisy-strewn field. Well, I'm not going to laugh at that because it's nice. But, oh, look, there's some shit. I'm going to laugh at that because that's horrible. <laughs> and if I didn't laugh, I'd go insane with existentialist terror. <laughs> <Come> <laughs> <on>. <laughs> um. So any sort of aspiring political cartoonists out there, what, what advice would you give them? What, what's the, the sort of best way to um, enter the industry this day? Well, let's see, the, the, this is the, 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 the perennial problem. I encountered it when I started out, that there are very, very few outlets in these mm -hmm. papers. Well, I mean, it's getting better now because certainly the, um, the Guardian and the Times job share. So I, as I said, I do two and a half a week. So I share that with Ben Jennings, and Steve Bell, um, which is, suits me perfectly. I don't want to do six a week because it drives you mad. But also it means you've got to free up spaces because there are so few outlets. Mm. There is all yeah. the generational law. And, you know, 30 years ago I was moaning about these useless old sods who were blocking things. And then, you know, one of them goes mad or dies or gets sacked or whatever. And the log jam shifts and then you sort of slowly get get in there um it's quite difficult to get into news to, to, to get into newspapers and i am constantly badgering the guardian to do something about it now they're promising they are going to do something about it but i have yet to find out what their exact proposals are <laughs> but one of the things i said there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't train up and nurture mm -hmm. people who think they want to be political cartoonists by publishing them online yeah, yeah. because actually it is an infinitely vast space yeah. and therefore you have room to have um space for people who are trying it out you know how um 11 years ago when steve was taking six weeks off over the summer and i was doing a my like, gulliver's travels graphic novel and i couldn't cover for them every day so i said well actually what you need to do you need to get six people and we need to just get them hmm. to do one each you cannot learn this job unless you're doing it you cannot understand the nature of the deadline you cannot understand the adrenaline rush you get knowing you've got a file and you've only got halfway through the herd of pigs and pinstripe suits on the horizon. <laughs> and, you know, kind of thing. and it's like jumping out of the back of an aeroplane with that parachute. It's such a thrill. <laughs> Every day. Thrill. 
That's amazing. And uh, and I know that you know some people think, oh, I'd love to be a political cartoonist. Then they actually confront the reality of the deadline yeah. and they find it absolutely terrifying. Whereas others think it's a real buzz. Mm. That's good. Good advice. Mm. Final question then. Tell us yeah. about the Martin Rolson cocktail. Oh yes. We tried to get this out with Simon, didn't he? He wouldn't tell us. <laughs> oh, well, it's, um, it's Talisca yep. and some rose liqueur, I think. Um, there's, a, there's, a very, uh, there's a very good young cartoonist who was actually at Kendall um, as a punter called Tom Johnston, mm-hmm. who um, in the gig I did on the Sunday morning said he'd, um, he'd had one. The night before in the blind beggar, and he found it coarse and bitter, which I was <laughs> yes, a really I good joke. Saying, yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I did foolishly have two of them on Thursday night. Oh, damn. Um, oh. And the next day I had to do a cartoon for The Guardian, which I did in the, in the art school, and I did not feel well. <laughs> <laughs> Must have been. I did not. I have not. I mean, Simon gave me the recipe. I have not made any. <laughs> with, with, yeah, it's so easy to uh, to have that extra drink it, at Simon's bar, isn't it? it? It's it just is. too easy. Well, yeah. you know, I had one of them. I thought this tastes absolutely brilliant, and I said, "Well, I better have another of those." And that was the mistake. It, yeah. But it was um, <laughs> like let's say about martinis, and this is the non-sexist version. Martinis are like tits and testicles. One is not enough, and three is too many. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Superb. So, what have you got planned for next year? Then, have you got anything coming out other than your your, your regular work? Um, well, I've got I've, uh, I've got a book coming out um, either just before Christmas or just after Christmas, which is called the Happiness Manifesto, which is published by a great guy called uh, Ryan, uh, who runs the Rockland Press in Detroit. Uh, okay. He's done lots of stuff, with and um, he did an underground comic called Black Eye, which I know quite a lot of stuff. With. And basically, it's a little 20-page pamphlet full of heavy-handed sarcasm about how to be happy. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we must all have the right to be heard. So it's <laughs> a sort of red screaming at a young black person in the corner being held aloft by Zuckerberg by the next page. But none must ever be upset, so it's the Nazi leadership looking at the History Channel and crying. <laughs> so, so essentially, I'm just taking the piss, and with luck, we are more enough. So is that going to be available over here as well, or is that more? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's Excellent. at the printers in Detroit. Excellent. I look forward to that. Yeah. Look forward to that. And otherwise, I've got, I've got a few ideas to pitch uh, to Emma, um, see if she picks up on them. Um, I've got another book I've been working on with um, Philippe Sands, the international lawyer, writer of East West Street. But he's written about the history of the International Court and the plight of the Chagos Islanders, you know, the... Chagos Islanders and these people um, who lived in the Chagos Islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and they were okay. forcibly expelled in 1968 to make room for a US air base. Right. And he represented them for years, and I've done these sort of huge spreads about the history of the International Court, five of them, and working with him, and it's, that's, that's been actually great. I mean, it's, um, mm. I do... I do like a uh, collaboration when it works, and I've had several collaborations which don't work, and I've had uh, a few which actually are joyous. Um, one of them, strangely enough, um, in these books about um, little potted biographies of the kings and queens and prime ministers and US presidents, written by a man called Andrew Jimson, who is one of the uh, associate editors of the Conservative Home website and the former leader writer on the Daily Telegraph. And weirdly enough, we get on like a house on it just goes to show, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Not, not all conservatives, anyway. Um. <laughs> uh, I always say political disagreements are one of the least good reasons for disliking. Yeah. 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 People I agree with politically are like a police out of pricks. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, Absolutely. Certainly looking forward to, to the future work. And, and, oh. and again... Thank you for the, the Lakes weekend. You, you've yes. brought us so much joy with, with your art and, and your, your comedic humour. Mm. It was great. So thank you again. And I deserve to win. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening. Find out more about the festival at comicartfestival.com. Find out more about the show and how to contact us at comicartpodcast.uk. Find us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. 
Music composed by Pop Noir.